In this next video, we will look at lecture two. And lecture two has a few more topics. Whoops, loud noises. Lecture two has a few more topics and some things that require more practice. So let's get into lecture two. Lecture two starts with cell morphology, and that's not something we covered in class, but it's in the video. So make sure you watch that and learn that terminology because those are words you need to know and be able to use. So um, this cell, for example, would be considered a cacobacillus. It's kind of between spherical shape and rod shaped. It's not really either one. Um, and it's by itself, so that's what it would be. But you might ask yourself, what would be the name of a pair of spherical cells? What would be the term for a pair of spherical cells? So two spherical cells stuck together. That's what I studied in graduate school. I studied a bacterium, well, the name of it will be interesting to you. That's what I studied. They show up in the micro microscope as a pair of spherical cells. So what would we call that? Pause the video and tell me. Okay, yeah, we would call that a diplococcus. Diplo means a pair. Coccus means a spherical cell. It'd be better if we use the um, plural, which would be diplococcus. Psi. And the bacterium I studied in graduate school was Enterococcus faecalis. Strain OG1RF. And the one I named was OG, strain OG1RF delta 1918. Boom. That's how you know I'm super famous, because I named that strain of bacteria. Anyway, um, learn those words. Then there is a section on why microorganisms are small. Make sure you go through these and understand them. I might ask you to tell me one or two reasons microorganisms are small. So these are all hypotheses. These are things we observe that make sense that are likely to give microorganisms an advantage as long as they are small. Um, but we, you know, we don't know for sure why they're small. We just know a lot of reasons why evolution would push them in that direction. And they include um, maximization of surface area relative to volume. And that's what this slide is about. It, you, and you don't have to do the algebra on this slide, but you have to understand the the ratio of surface area to volume and why that matters. Um, another one would be how fast molecules diffuse inside the cell. How long does it take RNA polymerase to get from wherever it is, like over here, to the part of DNA where it needs to transcribe a gene? How long does that take? Well, if this cell were huge, it would take a lot longer. So, um, that's one thing. And then small cells can divide faster. And the faster you divide, the faster you evolve, the faster you can adapt to your environment. Um, and then from there, we went into bacterial growth. So make sure you think about the cell cycle. What does a cell need to do before it can divide? So tell me, what does a cell need to do before it can divide? Pause the video. Tell me. I'm not thinking, and I just paused the recording. That was fun. Anyway, what I was hoping you would tell me is that a bacterial cell needs to make peptidoglycan because peptidoglycan limits how big it can be. So think about making a shirt bigger or pants bigger. What do you do? You add fabric, and they have to add peptidoglycan to become bigger. How do you make a cell membrane bigger? You add lipids to it and it becomes bigger. So in order to divide, cells need to first get big, and in order to do that, they need more peptidoglycan and more lipids. In order to get peptidoglycan and lipids, they need enzymes that make those things and enzymes that put them in the right place. So they need to make those enzymes, make lots of proteins. They need to copy their DNA. That requires enzymes. Ultimately, then they need to become a big cell and put half of their stuff on each side or each end of the cell, including one copy of the DNA on each end, and then they split into two cells. 
That's what we are picturing happening inside of these cells. Um, so then um, one challenge that comes up with that is that exponential growth happens and they go up at an ever increasing rate and that is where we get the idea of doubling time. We can measure their how long it takes a population to double or go up by a multiple of two and that should be constant for a, a happily growing cell in what we call log phase. So that's what this set of data shows is what the numbers would look like if it doubled every I think 15 minutes. 20 minutes. Doubled every 20 minutes. Um, and after a few hours, it's going up by orders of magnitude. Think about it. If it doubles in 20 minutes, in an hour, it's gone from 2 to 8. And in an hour and 20 minutes, it's gone from 2 to 16. So it's gone up by more than an um, order of magnitude in 16 minutes. So really, we think of um, if it doubles three times, it's gone up by a multiple of eight, so almost an order of magnitude. So if it doubles, if this population doubles for three hours, it's going up by almost three orders of magnitude. And so we can't graph that in any meaningful way unless we use semi-logarithmic graphing paper. So what I want you to do now is pause the video and tell me what is the, um, what is the value of, um, what is the value of this guy right here, the third from the top? So not this one, not this one, this one. What is the value of that? Pause the video and tell me, wait, 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 pause the video, tell me, and then convert it into decimal notation. Okay, how do we do this? We realize we want to know the value of this point, and so we know it's going to be an order of magnitude determined by um, this bold line below it. So any number in this region is going to be at the power of 10 of this bold line below it. Anything here would be the power of 10 of this, this line, and anything down here would be the power of 10 of this line. So 10 to the fifth power. It's going to be something times 10 to the fifth power. And then what do these lines mean again? Well, this bold one is always 1, and the first line above it is always 2. So this number is between 1 times 10 to the fifth power and 2 times 10 to the fifth power. And I would accept any answer between 1 times 10 to the fifth power and 2 times 10 to the fifth power. Realistically, looking at that, I'd say that's pretty close to 2. No, 1.2. No. Realistically, looking at that, I'd say it's close to 1.2 or 1.3 times 10 to the fifth power. But you don't need that kind of precision. Um, and then, how would I convert that? to decimal notation. So let's say my answer was 1 point, let's say 1.25 times 10 to the fifth power. I, I start with the non-zero integers and I remember the decimal point was here. It needs to move to the right five times because of this power of 10, five. So it needs to go one, two, three, four, One, two, three, four, five. And then we put in zeros, our little decimal point, and that gives us our number. One, two, five, zero, zero, zero. I can put a comma here, and I know that is 125,000. So um, that's how you do that. So make sure you're able to both do what I just did, and if I said put 125,000 on the graph, make sure you know where it would go. I won't make you tell the difference between like this point and this point. I will make it something that goes on one of the lines, but make sure you know what these lines all are. Um, cool. Something else you need to be able to do um, is understand turbidity. What is turbidity showing us? 
turbidity is showing us that there are cells in these tubes and they scatter light, um, and below some threshold, there aren't enough of them to scatter light. So we're seeing the black background behind this tube. Remind me, what, um, what is the threshold population for seeing turbidity? Again, that threshold, the number I gave you was 10 to the 6th. And what are the units on that? Pause the video and tell me the units. The units were cells per milliliter. And so a population of 10 to the 6 cells per milliliter is invisible. But a little bit higher than that, it starts to be visible as turbidity. So if we multiply 10 to the 6 cells per mil times the number of milliliters, like 750 milliliters in a water bottle, that gives us the answer, some answer in units of cells. And that's how we would figure out how many cells can hide in your water bottle. Um, another thing to know is growth phases. So now would be a great time to stop the video and tell you, like write or just say out loud, what is happening to the population here? What is happening to the population here? What is happening here? What is happening here? What's happening to the cells? Why does it look like this? And when does this happen? Go ahead, pause the video, and we'll come back. So this is what we see if we graph the population on a semi-logarithmic graph when we put microorganisms into a, um, a limited environment where they can't escape and no nutrients come into it. So they're stuck with whatever's already in there. It takes them a while to figure out what to do, and then they grow exponentially. They grow as fast as they can, and that is determined by their intrinsic properties, but also how, how warm is it, how much oxygen do they have, um, what nutrients are there, etc. And that determines how fast they grow and how big their ultimate population is. And then they run out of food, most likely, and they don't grow anymore. And during this this time, they're in dormancy trying to survive without new nutrients. And then eventually they lose that ability and they start to die at an exponential rate. Um, that's what to know about this. So make sure you can label these different stages and tell me what is happening at the different stages. Something I want you to think about is what's the difference between this population here and this population here? If you could picture it, would it look different? And it should, because this is a million cells and this is a billion cells. This is a thousand times more cells than there were down here. So these cells here, the way I like to think about it, they are loving life. They have more nutrients than they can imagine ever using. So they say, hey, let's all make daughter cells. These ones up here are so crowded, they can't even imagine the idyllic life of, of their ancestors. And very quickly, there are so many of them that, bang, they use up all the nutrients. Um, so that is what happens with exponential growth. It's just like, you don't see anything, there's nothing there, there's nothing there, it's just peaceful, and then you start to see a population, and then boom, it's huge. That is what exponential growth is like. That's what um, this graph would look like if it weren't on a semi-logarithmic scale. All right, so that's important. And then um, how do you write the names of microorganisms? So make sure you think of an example microorganism or example organism, species name. So, do you like oak trees? Learn a species of oak tree, learn its Latin name, and practice writing it and formatting it correctly. Um, if you can't think of any, say Homo sapiens, because that's us. Um, cool. Cool. So then, what else? That's part of taxonomy. And then what's phylogeny? 
pause and think about the difference between taxonomy and phylogeny. Phylogeny is the study of evolutionary relationships. Taxonomy is the study of classification. We always want our taxonomy to be based on phylogeny. Um, let's back up. You need to know how to put the taxonomic levels in order. Sorry, I forgot that. So these taxonomic levels, you need to be able to take a disordered list of them and put it into order. And the, um, the old mnemonic device was like, did King Philip, did King Philip come over for good sex? And then they didn't know about strains, so there was nothing after that. And the new mnemonic is, does Katy Perry claim orgasms feel good sometimes, sort of. Do what you must to remember things. Um, and you definitely don't have to memorize that, but it is a useful thing to think through. What, what is the difference between a domain and an order? Well, a domain is a big group that contains oak trees, mold, and you, and an order contains monkeys, lemurs, and you, so things that kind of look like you and you. And the farther down you get, the more the organisms in those groups look like you. So, um, yeah, phylogeny is a study of evolutionary relationships, and really what I want is for you to be able to use a phylogenetic tree like this. And what this shows, again, is the distance, or the short path between any two groups, like animals to slime molds, that distance correlates to how many differences there are between us that we can measure. So if we were comparing mammals, we'd say, how many differences are there in our bones? But we're not. We're comparing everything on Earth, so we're saying, how many differences are there in our DNA? And what we can do with this is we can say, well, is there a difference between how closely we are related to the fungi and how closely, say, two bacteria phyla are to each other? Yes, there is. Um, most of the diversity of life on Earth is among the bacteria. They have been evolving, doing their own thing for two billion years, something like that. They are super weird and they have become super different from each other. And it's only fairly recently that animals and fungi and plants appeared and started to diversify. Um, so, again, um, the, if you measure a distance along the shortest distance, between two different organisms, that's telling you how different they are. Um, and that's what phylogeny is trying to do, is tell us how different or how similar they are. So make sure you learn how to read this tree. That's what this slide is for, and this is for practicing. Um, and that's phylogeny, and that's it for lecture two.